Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's a, an honor and pleasure to be your host today. And uh, my name is Turbo Shetkovic, and I am the chairperson of Hong Kong Chamber of Commerce here in Sweden. And I am also a partner at Capman Infra, which is a Nordic investment company. And I am really pleased uh, to be hosting this fantastic event. I mean, we have, as you have seen, uh, you know, really, really top speakers today. Uh, and we are also really happy to see that, that so many of you, uh, or our guests, uh, were able to attend today. And uh, many of, of you already know us, uh, the Chamber, but having said that, I just wanted to kind of give two or three sentences uh, around us, because I also saw that we have some new guests here. And I mean, our road, the Chamber's road, is really to connect Sweden and Hong Kong, and in all ways that we can support and improve the businesses that is happening between Sweden and Hong Kong. Um, and we all know that, you know, we are in a pretty difficult time uh, related to the primarily the COVID-19 situation. Uh, and of course, uh, all crises are, you know, giving you also an opportunity to find new ways of working uh, because you simply have to. Uh, and of course, I would have loved to meet all of you in person, but at the same time, maybe, or probably, it would have been a challenge to actually get all of you together in this meeting, coming to different, different geographical location and different time zones. So um, I really would like to say that, you know, also we should take this crisis to continue to develop our businesses and to really find new opportunities. And of course, not neglect the very difficult situation that we are all in and people who are sick and everything. So wouldn't like to forget that. Uh, and today uh, we have, as I said, a fantastic uh, scene of speakers. And uh, we have our organizers have been telling me very strictly that I'm the one who are going to keep the times here today. So I will do my best here together with all our distinguished speakers to do that. But if we get carried away a little bit, I might be a little bit rude and interrupt you. <laughs> so I would like to excuse myself uh, if that will happen. Uh, and also, we, since we have so many uh, attendants and, and guests here today, of course, we also would like to allow the floor to ask questions. And then we really encourage you to use the chat function to let me know that you have a question that you would like to direct to, to some, someone of the speakers. And I will, uh, with my best effort, I will try to make that happen. So uh, with further, you know, with further, <laughs> no further ado, um, probably you should say, I would actually like to in invite our first speaker of today. And uh, we, we were supposed to have Mrs. Vinky So with us today, but due to personal reasons, she had to, to cancel with a little bit short notice. But we are really happy to introduce Mrs. Noel Eng, who will represent her in, uh, instead. And Mrs. Noel Eng has been the Deputy Director General at the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office London since April 2018. And prior to looking after Hong Kong's bilateral relationships with the Nordic countries and Russia in the office from July 2020. So she has worked very close to many of us and also have worked really hard who fostering the bilateral relationships with the UK and the Baltic countries. And before she arrived to London, she part participated in an air service agreements negotiations between Hong Kong and other countries for three and a half years as, as the, at the transport and housing business. And as we all know, I mean, aviation sector is really, really important to actually uh, enable us all to meet. However, it might be a little bit difficult for the time being. So with that, I would like you to, uh, I would like to welcome you, uh, Mrs. Eng, and I leave the stage over to you. Thank you, Tobo. 
Um, fellow speakers and panelists, friends from Hong Kong, ladies and gentlemen, um, good morning. It gives me great pleasure to join today's webinar. My name is Noel, and I'm the Deputy Director General of the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office, the official representative of the Hong Kong SAR government in the UK, Sweden, and seven other countries. Uh, my Director General, Ms. Wenqi So, um, would not be able to make it to today's, and she sends her regards and Sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, let me start again. So um, I'll use, make use of the following 10 minutes or so to give you a general overview of Hong Kong. And uh, I'm sure actually all of you are no strangers to Hong Kong, but the term Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, commonly known as Greater Bay Area or GBA, may not be as familiar. Indeed, it is a relatively new development with its outline development plan promulgated just in early 2019. So what is GBA? It comprises two special administrative region. Sorry, I'm gonna load the PowerPoint for everyone to see. So the GBA, so it comprises two special administrative regions of Hong Kong and Macau and nine municipal cities of Guangdong provinces. The total area is around 56,000 square kilometers uh, with a total population of over 72 million. The GDP of GBA is 1,679.5 billion US dollar which is almost three times the Swedish GDP in 2019 and accounts for 12% of China's GDP. It compares very well with the existing Greater Bay Area developments around the world and has enormous market potentials. So the objectives of GBA are to further cooperation amongst Guangdong, Hong Kong and Macau fully leveraging the composite advantages of the three places. Each city would, according to their comparative advantages, contributes to the regional economic development. So amongst the city in the Greater Bay Area, Hong Kong is the most open and international city. We are known for its status in international financial, transportation, trade centers, and aviation hub, as well as our renowned professional services. We have long been the world's freest economy. The Heritage Foundation has ranked Hong Kong as the world's freest economy for 25th consecutive years, and we came second in 2020. Operating a low and simple tax regime that is 16.5% corporate tax and a common law system, we came third in terms of ease of doing business. Indeed, the large number of overseas offices we have in Hong Kong is an endorsement of our business-friendly environment and international outlook. In 2019, meet 2019, there were more than 9,000 regional headquarters, regional offices, and local offices in Hong Kong, with their parent companies located outside Hong Kong. Well, thanks to our strategic geographical location, we are very well connected. Hong Kong is in the heart of Asia, where we can reach half of the world's population within the five hour flight radar. We are in the Southeast coast of China with excellent land and sea connectivity to the mainland with infrastructure project like the high-speed rail or the Hong Kong-Zhuhai-Macau bridge. 
coupled with our effective cargo handling mechanism, the Hong Kong International Airport is the world's busiest cargo airport. Well, but on the other hand, Shenzhen is a hub with high concentration of the mainland's innovation and technology resources and talents. Whilst Guangdong has developed into a global influential high-tech industrial belt with a division of labor amongst the cities. Making use of the comparative advantages of these cities, the Hong Kong SNR government and Shenzhen Municipal People's Government are jointly developing the Hong Kong Shenzhen Innovation and Technology Park at the 87 hectare Lok Ma Zhou Loop, which will be the largest ever innovation and technology platform in Hong Kong. Advanced work are underway at the park, and the first building is scheduled for completion by 2024. We are also able to utilize our strengths as the International Financial Center to help with the INT development in the region. Hong Kong has made changes earlier to our listing regime to allow secondary listing of mainland innovative companies on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. The result has been proven very successful as there were altogether 10 such companies listed, raising a total of over 220 billion Hong Kong dollar. And the central government has also agreed to expand the scope of Shanghai and Shenzhen Connect to include Hong Kong listed pre-profit biotechnology companies and mainland companies on the Science Tech Innovation Board. So watch out for the development space of INT in Hong Kong and GBA. And uh, you may wonder actually, as a company from Sweden or the Nordic countries, how would you be able to benefit from these? Where should one begin? And I would suggest look no further because Hong Kong is your natural go-to place. There are unique advantages to start your business in Hong Kong and operate as a Hong Kong company. And I can assure you that such advantages can only be enjoyed in Hong Kong, but not elsewhere. And I will highlight three of such. First, Hong Kong has a very well-established legal system firmly based on the rule of law. And it is the only city in GBA practicing the common law system. We recognize that the international business communities may feel more at ease with the common law system. So to this end, we have concluded eight, eight arrangements with the mainland in civil and commercial matters. Take, for example, the arrangement signed between courts of the mainland and Hong Kong in 2019 allow parties with assets in China and Hong Kong to have more options in determining their preferred dispute resolution mechanism for civil and commercial matters in China or in Hong Kong. And secondly, we have well, an unparalleled sorry. access well. to mainland markets from Hong Kong. Noel, can you hear me? Unique access channels for cross-border portfolio investment flows to and from China. Noel, can you hear me? And finally, we have the mainland and Hong Kong Closer Economic Partnership Agreement, SIPA. So um, SIPA has opened up huge opportunities for Hong Kong goods and services. And uh, Hong Kong was the mainland's third largest trading partner in 2019, and also its second largest export market. I think I will be able to go on for another hour or so, but I am acutely aware that we are uh, having a very packed schedule today with a lot of different speakers. So um, I think I'll stop for now, but uh, if you are interested, please feel free to contact our office. Thank you, Tavo. Excellent, Noel. Uh, I tried to give you a heads up that you had one more minute, but you managed it perfectly. <laughs> so thank, uh, can, I, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me, Noel? No. Okay. Um. Uh, it seems to be something wrong yeah, with my. No, I think we can hear you perfectly. We can oh, hear you perfectly. Yeah. Thank you for. <laughs> it was like. <laughs> Uh, kind of very um, silent on the other side. So thank you for letting me know. I was just going to say that thank you so much, uh, Noel, for sharing and putting the platform for this really important seminar. 
And I mean, the Greater Bay Area, as you've been putting it really rightly here, is really a fantastic scene. And there is a lot of opportunities there. And I think we are now going to the two next speakers where we are going to dive into that a little bit more in, in detail. And uh, the, um, the title of the next, next se session in the seminar is the Hong Kong scene. And we will then talk about the FinTech development and opportunities in Hong Kong, as well as the role of Hong Kong science and technology park. And to our health, uh, to be able to walk this through, we are really honored to have two distinguished uh, speakers with us. And it's Mr. King Long, who is the head of the FinTech at, in, uh, FinTech at Invest Hong Kong. And before he joined Hong Kong government, King was a serial entrepreneur, angel investor, and university lecturer in Asia, the US, and, and UK. And also we have Mr. Albert Wong uh, to, with us today, who was appointed CEO of Hong Kong Science Park in August 2016. And Mr. Wong has more than 30 years of experience of commercial, industrial, <laughs> and leadership roles with various multinationals including 15 years spent with GE in the US headquarters in Asia and Pacific and China. So uh, with further, you know, uh, without further ado, I would like to hand over the word to the both of you. Right, um, so th thank you for the introduction. And perhaps I can uh, just start with some slides. And uh, I would like to uh, basically just quickly walk through the higher level picture. And then obviously Albert uh, heads up a very enormous and very representative uh, major hub of in innovation in Hong Kong, in which uh, I think uh, Albert will go into more details about what Hong Kong Science Park has to offer. So with that, I just want to perhaps to warm up uh, our audience today, because I see that we have a very mixed uh, diverse backgrounds of audience in which I just want to give you some facts. Now, at the end of the day, when you look at the Hong Kong markets, you know, the financial services sector is very vibrant and rich. So I won't go into the numbers specifically, but, but it's fair to say that particularly if you are in, in engaging in the B2B fintech solution space, Hong Kong really is the right place for you to enter uh, as a springboard to the rest of Asia simply because of the uh, more familiar environments uh, of a international uh, system. But at the same time, many of the international banks, the insurance companies, uh, chances are they have a major presence in Hong Kong, now including the regional headquarters. So that's why the, the soil is very rich, particularly for the B2B players. Now, and I won't go into the detail of uh, uh, GBA, which uh, Noel has uh, touched on. Now, the other bit of it, I just want to quickly highlight is that uh, obviously for the past uh, many, year, many years, the Hong Kong government has been very conscious in looking at the different pockets of areas in which we are able to offer uh, more help uh, for entrepreneurs, including the, the, those folks from overseas. So the, essentially for the FinTech uh, domain, uh, my team has uh, looked at all the whole host of uh, you know, supporting schemes offered by the governments and basically summarize it based on the journey. So from the R&D, you know, the, uh, the hiring, business development, in the ongoing fundraising, the overseas expansion, the chances are if you do enter the Hong Kong markets, you know, there'll be some sort of support schemes that'll be a relevant for you. And actually in terms of the dollar amounts, now you see a lot of numbers here, which I won't go into details at the moment, but then actually my team has added up all the, uh, the schemes uh, eligible for the, the FinTech uh, domain. If you really apply all of them and get them approved, you are talking about Hong Kong dollars, like $25 million, uh, so which is roughly you know, 2.5 million euros. So this is a pretty substantive help to basically get you, uh, get, get your business, uh, kickstart and expand uh, with Hong Kong as a launchpad. Now, uh, of course, I think that you'll also be aware of the uh, the fundraising scene in Hong Kong, particularly the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. But just, just two numbers, two set of numbers to put the whole thing in perspective. Now, on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see that basically we are looking at 
1.5 billion US dollar of private venture capital fundraising of just the fintech sector alone. Okay. Now on the right hand side, this is the public fundraising via the Hong Kong Exchange, in which uh, we we're able to raise over 10 billion US dollar uh, in the past many years. And of course, I think the IP, the uh, the whole Hong Kong market is really known for the reasons uh, I think uh, interest in the IPO space. So that's why if you are a later stage company, Hong Kong is definitely a very good uh, option for you. Now, I think it goes without saying that Hong Kong is a free trade board, has been very business friendly. The tax is just, uh, I mean, it's just very competitive. Again, I won't go into details, but as you can see in the sort of like circle in the middle, basically as an aggregate, aggregate you know, the tax uh, that you're paying as a corporate uh, and as well as the individual level is just uh, so far lower compared with a lot of the other uh, Asian uh, major cities. So this is why uh, Hong Kong has been uh, the uh, major hub that people consider because of uh, some of the tax savings uh, consideration. Now, and you may ask, if you do want to come in, you know, what are the different channels uh, that you can explore? Now, um, I won't go into a lot of details of all the different players, but it's, it's fair to say that there are just a lot of organizations like uh, what the Albert will be talking about very soon, you know, the Science Park, and we have another major incubator called Cyberport, which is also funded by the home governments. Uh, we have the regulators, they can provide help and advice on the licensing issues. And then we have the various universities in terms of talents, uh, different associations. You want to get access to the individual companies uh, in terms of the attraction and communication with potential clients. Now the investor side can connect you with, you know, the family office association, as well as the individual the VCs and uh, PE investors. So basically there's just a lot of resources in Hong Kong. So that I think the entry point typically is through you know, Hong Kong, because basically as a Hong Kong government body, we are tasked to be kind of the entry points for international uh, companies like yourself, so that uh, we can make your life easier by connecting you to the right uh, you know, resource to basically fast track your market entry. Now, uh, since I know that uh, Albert will be uh, speaking, so I've just pulled some slides from our uh, partner, which is another incubator, uh, Saba Ports. Now, again, there's just a different schemes. I mean, the, the, the purpose for this slide is just to give you an idea that from the very early stage to the later stage uh, of a startup, basically there are different funds or different sub subsidy schemes that the, the Hong Kong government funded incubator like Sideport and Science Park uh, will be given out to basically help you along the way. And, and also you can see some of the, uh, the icons here in terms of the organizations that already participated or received some of these support uh, from the Cyberport. Now, and in case you are in the FinTech space and you wonder, so what are the different segments of uh, FinTechs uh, in Hong Kong? Again, since we talk about uh, our, our nice partners, our port, and uh, again, because they have been doing this a bit earlier. Uh, so that's why the, in a way, when we look at the whole Hong Kong FinTech ecosystem of around 600 companies, actually uh, around 400 of those uh, reside uh, or affiliated uh, with Cyberport. And as you can see in this, uh, this chart, you can see that they're different, a pretty nice representation. Uh, there isn't really like a very dominant space. It's pretty balanced, right? So the banking infrastructure, you know, to different like enterprise solutions, the wealth tech, the rec tech, the insure tech, and so on. So pretty well represented. So that's why we just feel that, you know, the so-called so the early uh, education bit has already been done based on some of the earlier uh, entrants in the Hong Kong market. So now when you talk to, let's say a bank about almost like any domain, uh, chances are the banks really understand. So at the moment, our job is to really invite more uh, cutting edge um, leading the FinTech companies to come to Hong Kong to help us further enrich the ecosystem. So again, I, I want to just quickly give you some highlights. And uh, again, if there are any questions, I'm happy uh, to take uh, more questions. But now that I laid out the overview, then I'll just hand it over uh, to the host and also Albert, so that we can dive in a bit deeper in the other areas. So thank you very much.
So thank you, Mr. Long. I think we have Mr. Wong coming in directly. Yeah, I'm here. Um, you, I, you are. I assume you can hear me, but uh, I cannot start my video, but that's okay. I have my PowerPoint. Um, if you want to see my face, you can, un, un, you can connect my video, but that's okay. So uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes to talk about the uh, um, accelerating growth and um, technology in, in Hong Kong. Um, so actually, in most cases, when people talk about Hong Kong, in many cases, you will not talk about Hong Kong as a technology area. Okay. Um, I think uh, this, is, this is a fair comment. However, in the past number of years, we have tried, the government has put a lot, a lot of resources and uh, policy around technology innovation. So this is what the government has promised on the left-hand side, the eight focus areas that the, um, that the, uh, gov that the uh, 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 chief executive is um, checking every, on a regular basis. How often, how much are we, no, I'm sharing the screen. Okay, sorry. Sorry. Okay, all right. Um, so the government is, is checking on everything, including resources for R&D, talent, funding, uh, procurement, uh, all the things that related to innovation technologies, but also there's been close to, uh, well, more than 100 billion Hong Kong dollars. That is roughly 13 billion US dollars that has been put into innovation technology in the past few years. So we are, although we might be slightly late, we are on a path to going after innovation technologies in the coming years. So uh, very quickly, I will talk about what the Science Park is all about. Science Park is a um, infrastructure that is on the northern part of the uh, Kowloon. We have roughly about 4 million square feet of uh, research and development and laboratory spaces. So we talk about 400,000 square meters. And right now we have over 900 technology companies in the science park. We have been working very hard for the past 20, uh, 18 years. We now have eight, 900 companies in the science park. Of the 900 companies, about 400 of them are startups. So we run an incubator and uh, some, if a company, if someone from universities wants to start a company, we can help them with starting a company, doing product development, funding the application, finding the funding investors and a whole host of things. Out of the 900 companies, we have about 9,000 of the uh, uh, total population. Total population in the science park today is about 13,000. We have about 9,000 of the 13,000 research and development. I got to say that we are the largest concentration of research and development in Hong Kong. Um, we are, we, our focus is in research and development, probably not so much about research, more on development. Um, the research can be done in the universities, but the development, including, for example, our good friend Scania has a major setup in the, in, in, in the science park doing research and development, fleet management and things like that. And Carl Frederick is going to tell you about it. And we also have a number of um, things that we do, including um, investment in the past three years. The investment that has been raised in the science park is close to 30 billion US dollars. That's about 4 billion US dollars in three years. And our focus areas are in the middle. We talk about AI, robotics, biomedical, fintech, and smart cities. So these are the, some of the milestones that we have hit in the past 18 years. We have two unicorns. You probably have heard about SenseTime, which is an artificial intelligence facial recognition company. Uh, SenseTime today is probably worth to, close to 20 billion US dollars. A startup that started about in 2014, six years ago, it's now worth 20 billion US dollars. Lala Move is a uh, e-business logistics company. It's now worth to roughly 2 billion US dollars. It started about four or five years ago. We talked about incubation program. Um, so far, we have over 700 companies that have graduated from us and 80% of them are still in business. Our investment, I talked about raising 30 billion Hong Kong dollars in the past three years. We, at Science Park, we are also a VC ourselves. This is we, have, we run a fund of roughly 600 million Hong Kong dollars, which is about 80 million US dollars. Um, so I am a 80 million US dollar VC. And the VC that we, that, that uh, the investment that we do, uh, we bring in about 13 times of the leverage. In other words, every dollar that, that I invest, we bring in about $13 for the, for the investee. 
We do a lot of uh, adoption. We partner with the major corporations in the region, not just in Hong Kong, but in the region. And uh, it could be very traditional businesses such as uh, Cathay Pacific, which is going through a tough time. We help them with the digitization, with the adoption of technologies, banks, Disneyland, and uh, uh, some of the major corporations. On the bottom left, we talk about the various incubation programs that we do, including if you have a just writing an app, um, it will be just one or two years, IncoTech, IncoBio. If you're going into biomedical area, the incubation will go on for about three to four years. This is the uh, investment that we talk about. We have about roughly a thousand investors that are active with us. These are early stage investments. And uh, this is one of the mo most important strategic um, development that the Science Park is, is, uh, is working on to bring in investors to help the technology companies find, an, a, find the next steps. The one, this is the one step, um, one stop fundraising platform. We have uh, over a thousand VCs that are actively working with us. I can tell you that at any one time, there will be investors sniffing around in the science park looking for ideas and technology to invest in. And we are expanding this one. I got to admit that early stage investment in Hong Kong is not quite there yet, but we are working on it. We already, already have 1,000 active investors. So this is the one, one thing that I want to talk a little bit more about in you know, Hong Kong. What you know Hong Kong is about is that the Hong Kong government tee up about uh, 10 billion Hong Kong dollars, that's about 1.3 billion US dollars about a year ago. And that 10 billion Hong Kong dollars will be distributed among about 20 to 30 global research institutes that, uh, that will be partnering with local universities in the areas of health and AI robotics. So each one of these institutes will get roughly about 300 to 400 million Hong Kong dollars in research and development in healthcare and AI robotics. And they're all doing it in the science park. So as we speak, we have these institutes moving in the science park doing researches in such as stem cell, um, uh, CAR-T, um, microbiome, surgical robot, logistic robot. 28 of them are moving in as we speak. One of the examples I can talk about is for example, Harvard Engineering is uh, partnering with Hong Kong U in the medical device development in the science park. And you can expect them not just doing, not just writing scientific papers, but doing a lot of downstream commercialization development kind of work. The other one would be a surgical robot that, that we are partnering between Chinese University and Imperial College. So these are just two, two of the examples that are happening in the science park as we speak. In those cells, this is a new development. We have a this is not a hotel, but a residential building that, that is being completed right now. We'll be moving in starting in the next, next month or so that will accommodate about 400 rooms. So researcher or entrepreneur that are in Science Park can, have, can find a place to live. We understand that people find Hong Kong expensive to live. And this is one, ways, one, one of the ways to help uh, mitigate that problem. Um, Noel will talk briefly about the uh, Greater Bay Area. I don't think I can, I need to expand further on this. Hong Kong itself is about 7.5 million population. It's not a big market, but as soon as you cross the border into the Greater Bay Area, all of a sudden you're looking at 67 million population, which is um, a microcosm of the whole China, 1.3, 1.4 billion population. So the, the strategy, the opportunity for Hong Kong in the areas of innovation technology is not so much about finding the application the final application in Hong Kong itself because it's only 7 million population. But because of the strength in research and development in Hong Kong, by the way, we have four universities in Hong Kong that are ranked top 50 in the world. Four universities in one city. This is the envy of the whole Greater Bay Area, Southern China. So what you want to think about is to use Hong Kong as a base for innovation and technology for research and development. And then you want to make use of the Greater Bay Area as a hub for application and business development, where you have 66, 67 million population and all kinds of commercialization and uh, supply chain investment opportunity. So this is a, a quick summary, quick um, presentation of what Hong Kong is all about. We are determined to put our resources into innovation technologies, leveraging our strength in the Greater Bay Area and the research capabilities and the resources that the government are putting in um, we will be on a path 
to putting ourselves on the map of innovation technology in the region and in the world. So this is my presentation. If there's any question, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And truly impressive what you have achieved uh, over the years. And as you were kind of ending your presentation with, I mean, just putting up, putting up also these impressive numbers. I mean, it's really a super interesting area for us to, to be connected to. Uh, so actually, uh, I will now hand over to, to the next speakers. And now we are actually going to deep a little bit diver into the business climate in Hong Kong. How is it these days? And I talked about the COVID situation in, in my, you know, in, in the kickoff of this seminar. But there are, of course, other things as well that is affecting our business climate. And to help us uh, to discuss this, we will have uh, Johan Lennefalk, who is the office manager at Business Sweden uh, in Hong Kong. And Mr. Johan Lennefalk has a degree in engineering, and he is the head of Business Sweden's Hong Kong office. And you have more than eight years of experience from market entry strategy and growth in Asia for Swedish companies. And you have been based in China, Hong Kong, and South Korea, and advising startups, SMEs, as well as publicly listed companies to really, you know, how to enter these really interesting markets. And you will also have Christian Berg and Strule, uh, you know, to discuss this together with you to discuss these questions. And Mr. Mr. Christian Berg and Strule is uh, the new general manager. Mm -hmm of the Swedish Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. And pretty um, recently, you actually stepped into your position and we are really welcoming to start to work closer with you. And Mr. Bayern Strohle has an extensive background in marketing, uh, project management and events planning. So with that, I would like to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to say, uh, thank you so much for inviting us to be part of the seminar. Uh, as you all heard, uh, my name is Christian Bajansrolle and I will start and then Joanne will continue. Um, I am since October 1st actually the new general manager at the Swedish Chamber of Commerce here in Hong Kong, uh, replacing Eva Kolbein, who I assume quite a few of you have met during the years uh, with all the amazing work that she has uh, done. Um, Swedish companies have actually a very strong presence in Hong Kong and have had it for quite a long time. Uh, the chamber itself, uh, a chamber by members, for members, has been here since 1986. So there are quite a few years of experience of doing business in this region. Uh, today, uh, we have about 150 member companies, and then we have uh, also individual members and some overseas members as well who see the value of, of having one foot on the market without uh, maybe being here uh, present themselves. Uh, if I just look at the, the member categories that we have, we do see uh, multiple sectors, uh, financial services, retail, creative industries, among others. And we also have quite a good mix uh, of companies, uh, everything from the large international corporations, uh, the mid-sized companies, and also the, the entrepreneurs. So when we look at the market, we do see the market from different angles with different perspectives. Uh, also, the members that we have here, uh, a lot of the companies have an interest in the region, and they have this as a regional office uh, to reach out towards mainland and towards other countries in the APAC region. Um, <coughs> sorry, uh, we definitely live in a changing world, and everything that is happening around us uh, affects us very much and also affects the businesses. Uh, we as a chamber needs to change along with all these other changes. And we can only do so if we speak to members and we listen to you know, the new challenges and what is happening around them. Um, I have met quite a few companies since I took over this position. And it's interesting to listen to uh, what, what each and every one is saying because even if it is a challenging time, uh, we have had the, the protests, we have had uh, the, the uh, new laws, we have had uh, the pandemic. But still, I have to say that there is a quite optimistic view. Uh, a lot of companies have a wait and see approach. 
Uh, and I think that is kind of what we see throughout the world. It's not really Hong Kong only, it is the rest of the world that has to have a wait and see approach and has to be you know, prepared to changes, no matter what the changes are. Um, another way to understand the business climate is of course uh, doing this kind of survey that me and Joanne are, are uh, going to talk about. And this is an initiative that we do with Team Sweden here in Hong Kong. And Team Sweden is, uh, besides the chamber, is Business Sweden and uh, the Consul General as well. We have done this survey uh, with our member companies and together with Business Sweden. Uh, through the survey, uh, we, of course, increase the understanding of the opportunities and challenges that the Hong Kong market holds for Swedish companies. It, kind of mirrors the, the, the diversity that we can see among the members. Uh, about a third of the respondents are representing the big corporations, 17% uh, the medium size, and then the rest are the smaller businesses. The survey itself is divided into four different segments. Uh, first, there is an economic outlook. Uh, the second part is the perception of business climate and the advantages and disadvantages of doing business here. The third part is about Swedish companies' operations and perceived, uh, perceived uh, success factors. And the last part is more connected to sustainability-related aspects and how that impacts business. And I have to say the last part for us as a chamber is even more interesting because one of our, uh, one of our biggest committees is actually the Sustainability Committee, who is doing a great job in creating a, things that makes an impact. They recently made a, a position paper on green recovery that has gotten the attention from media and also Hong Kong government. So we do see that, you know, what the Swedish companies are doing here really makes a difference and that we can take it a step further. So um, I have to say that, that me as well, I do have a positive view and I look at the future in a positive way. Um, and many of the companies that has been part of our study is also companies that have been here for a long time. As much as 37% of uh, the respondents have been here more than 20 years. So they know the market, they know the business, they have been through the changes. Uh, so so it's, uh, it's very relevant answers. So I will let uh, Joanne actually uh, take over and dig a little bit deeper on the results uh, of the study and what the companies actually think and, and how they act. So over to you, Joanne. Yes, first of all, can you hear me? Maybe just, uh, you can yeah. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. I started drilling here in the background, so I changed room. So good to good to know <laughs> that they're here. And of course, um, Christian, th thank you for the introduction. Uh, and uh, you touched upon some of the parts that I uh, will go through here as well. But I think I only have uh, 10 minutes, so I will uh, focus on some other areas here. But as Christian uh, mentioned here, if we're looking on the survey, and we've been doing this for a long time, but this year has been rather unique. So we did, um, we started doing the survey in the spring. But then, of course, we had COVID uh, appearing all of a sudden, as well as the uh, social security law uh, and national security law, which meant we had to do um, add another survey actually in the middle of the process. So we already had a lot of results, but then in the middle of the summer, we decided to add this. So it's so a bit of a unique experience, but nevertheless interesting. And as uh, Christian mentioned here, if you look on the size of the companies here in terms of how big they are, half of them are actually, you know, less than 250 employees globally. So the companies are not that huge by international standards, I would say. And what makes uh, Hong Kong a, a bit different, at least compared to, you know, China and Korea, where I worked previously, is that it's very heavily focused on the professional services. And that, of course, mirrors Hong Kong's breakdown as an economy, actually since the biggest sectors are you know, real estate and uh, fin finance sectors, as opposed to, for example, China, which is more manufactured oriented. So that is also mirrored here in the Swedish uh, breakdown of companies. And as Christian also mentioned, uh, 37 of them are quite mature in terms of how long they've been here. So more than 20 years. And then we have a bigger group, half of them that's been here, um, yeah, uh, 
15 years uh, or so coming in. Uh, but, but going ahead then, and as uh, mentioned previously as well, when you ask how the business outlook is, um, you see in the middle here, it's mostly around neutral, but also, of course, uh, some indicating poor and very poor. Um, but this has always been very positive if you go back. It's always been you know, good or sort of very positive. So unfortunately, um, this is another picture we've seen. Uh, but on the other hand, um, as we'll see here later, uh, COVID, I think, has been a bigger um, challenge for many of these. But on the other hand, still 82% are actually profitable or at least break even. So um, I think there are other places in the world that has been uh, more severely um, affected by this. And also just touching upon the, the tourist and travel side of things, obviously with, with COVID um, hitting and also the social unrest, there was a very big drop in tourists and especially Chinese uh, tourist arrivals. As uh, many of you know, Hong Kong uh, is a big uh, tourist market actually. Uh, despite only being around 7 million inhabitants, it has more than 60 million visitors every year. so almost 10 times as many. And a big share of that, I think around 80% are from mainland. And of course that completely uh, vanished uh, this year since no one can, can travel here. And normally you have roughly 1.6 million people visiting during October holiday and Lunar New Year. So a lot of the retail stores were really heavily affected by that and the tourism industry, as I point out here. But on the other hand, if you talk about the share of GDP, it doesn't affect so much. But I know, of course, that we have companies on this call that might be affected more in the retail space or service space, for example. And then if you ask, OK, the, the impact uh, on this national security law, uh, of course, uh, negative as might be expected, but also actually some that indicate that there might be a bit of a positive um, silver lining to this with, with more stability and sort of stores can be open, operate more normally. Um, but then if you ask, OK, so what are you planning to do uh, So as a consequence of this? We actually see that 70% roughly say the take a wait and see approach. So no drastic outflow or inflow of companies for that matter. So basically rather stable. And I would say we, we're seeing uh, uh, an increased interest again picking up uh, for, for coming here. Then just questions that were picked up in this survey in terms of uh, what questions that are brought up. It's of course, you know, will this jeopardize Hong Kong's status as an international trade center since it's a financial hub? Uh, but once again, we haven't seen any uh, you know, big outflow of financial firms or some uh, similar aspects. And of course, uh, Hong Kong's status under the one country, two systems um, set up as well of you know the law that was uh, mentioned in the uh, introduction speech here, actually, that you have a very uh, respected uh, law uh, system uh, and uh, the, the ju juridical system around it. But I think one problem is that, or one challenge that, that larger companies mention is the, the potential talent to drain, because Hong Kong is, a very, is a very well known for having good um, schooling and, and, and housing for, for attracting top talent. And when you cannot travel and you know, schools are closed, that's a question mark. And also, of course, the risk is if other governments take uh, actions on this. So some, uh, this is some of the concerns that have been raised. I'm just going to jump across here. But when you actually compare the impact of uh, the national security law and COVID, uh, the COVID situation, we see actually here that it's been a bigger impact by COVID. Uh, of course, that's a global uh, situation, but, but, but regardless, there's a bigger worry. And that's something we've seen uh, across uh, all industries, I would say. And stability is very uh, valued, I would say, generally speaking. So that's the key. So, so of course, you can download this report. I'm going to go through everything in detail here. So some of the numbers here on the left side are a bit outdated, but you can see that when you ask them about the investments, what are your investment plans? We only see that 1% say that they will leave the market. So most say, you know, either unchanged or slightly unchanged uh, or, or, you know, reduced, but not leaving. So, uh, of course, uh, Christian has a very good uh, insight into the chamber members and in and outflows there. Uh, but that's, I would say, good at least to see that there's not, um, you know, a major situation there where companies are leaving. Then uh, we, we touched upon this as Hong Kong's uh, role as a hub, and that's definitely the case for Swedish companies, as Christian also mentioned. And when you ask them 
which are the key markets going forward. Uh, obviously, being in Hong Kong, Hong Kong is one of those markets. But China, 75% uh, of the companies mention China as a key market going forward. But then we see, you know, Southeast Asia emerging. So we have Vietnam, Indonesia, Singapore, but also big markets, naturally Japan, Taiwan, and also, you know, Korea and, and India. So, so definitely playing a key regional role, as well as the Greater Bay Area that we, of course, talked about in the beginning, and the tier one cities in China, so Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Guangzhou. And then just touching a bit on the Swedish brand, uh, Sweden has you know, a good situation where we're associated with, with uh, connotations like quality, trust, and sustainability. And of course, sustainability, as Christian mentioned, is a key value for Swedish companies. So we see that this is an area that, that uh, we have a lot uh, to, to play, an important role to play, and the Chamber is very active in that. And we work in other areas that I will mention soon, for example, real estate and so on, to really be on top of that and drive the agenda with, with the Hong Kong government. And just want to touch upon, as someone mentioned, what the companies actually do here. So on the left side, you see a lot of the companies have regional offices. So they do marketing and sales, uh, a bit of sourcing. And I think we have some people on this call active in that field. Um, and the key aspects are, of course, those relationships. So I'm not going to dwell on this slide, but but as many of you, of course, know, there's not so much production, for example, uh, here. So so most of the Swedish companies have a small small footprint in start in terms of staff compared to, for example, mainland China. Um, and then just uh, ending here on on the areas that we sort of see opportunities in. Uh, so business climate. Uh, might be a bit negative, but there are opportunities. So in real estate and smart grid, for example, we're working with Cyanogroup, Group, or a large developer, to bring Swedish prop tech and sustainable real, um, real estate technologies to the Greater Bay Area and Hong Kong. And also Smart Grid, we have a big demo day, actually, a pitching um, competition in January. So, so if you're interested in that, you can reach out to me. But also, of course, healthcare. Hong Kong has an you know, aging population. And there's a big need to, to upgrade hospitals, and there's a big plan for that in the coming 10 years, as well as the elderly care space. And of course, a big transformation going on in, in retail and consumer goods, uh, you know, being more digitalized. And I'm sure we have a lot of experts on this call in that area with design and you know, Nordic Innovation House and everything comes with that. Uh, a lot of interesting areas. So these are the three I want to finish with. I think, uh, yeah, I had one minute to spare. So I'm going to save that for the next speaker, but if you have uh, questions later, I'll gladly stay on and answer any such. Hope you can still hear me. Thank you, both of you. I mean, really inspiring and just a uh, comment from my side. I mean, as you have been pointing out, I mean, we have challenges and it's not only the COVID, but some of you might have, uh, and this I think will be a bridge to the next section of speakers, but like 10 days ago, we did have a very interesting entrepreneur who were visiting uh, our webinar from, uh, and he was he is based in Hong Kong and he's doing sourcing uh, in the retail sector. And he was actually pointing at you, I mean, despite everything that happens, or actually thanks to a lot of the changes right now, I mean, uh, his business had, uh, he had been able to actually grow his business due, even though uh, the COVID has been very, you know, difficult for many of us. So I think it's, you should always take, as we have been talking about, I mean, always take advantage of a good crisis and try to see what you can do out of it. And, you know, starting to thinking in, in new ways and not getting stuck in the old ways of behavior. So with that, I mean, thanks again. Really interesting to, to listen to you, both of you. And again, Christian, welcome um, to the new job, basically. <laughs> and with that, I would like us to move on uh, to the next session. And the headline for that is doing business in Hong Kong. And now we are going to get experiences and advices from three super companies who have actually done it. Uh, and um, we, have, uh, we have 15 minutes for each speaker, including potential questions. But I will start this one off with giving the floor to Mr. Peter Luxemburg. And Ms. Luxemburg is an e-commerce seller and consultant and has worked in China since 2007. And you are now um, based in Hong Kong, where you have founded Frost, limited 
and you did that 2014. Which, and the company is focused on online commerce and Amazon native brands. And uh, for, we are really, really intrigued now to hear your story. So I will leave the stage over to you. Yeah, do we have Mr. Luxembourg? Um, hello, Peter. <clears throat> okay, it seems to be something that doesn't work. Uh, so actually, uh, we will then move over to the next speaker. Uh, so I would like then to introduce Mrs. Katarina Ivarsson, who is the Managing Director Asia. Um, and you have a degree in Industrial Design from Lund University and Hong Kong PolyU School of Design. And in 2009, uh, you founded Boris Design Studio in Hong Kong. And you joined many one in 2019, where you are now working as a partner. Uh, Katarina is also the vice chair, vice chair person of the Swedish Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong and has co-authored several books as Building Folkemet, um, among others. So Katarina, uh, I will leave the floor over to you. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen here to you. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah, works perfect. 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 Very uh, honored to be here today and talking uh, and meeting all of you guys, even if it's on a virtual seminar instead of an IRL seminar. And um, I'm going to hear to talk to you today about doing business in Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area, uh, which I've been doing actually since 2005 when I first came out to Hong Kong. Uh, and it's been a fantastic journey to be here uh, and a lot have changed, uh, but also in terms of a lot of more dynamics taking place, not the least in the Greater Bay Area. So um, just to start off a little bit on the background of where we come from, um, many one is a global strategic design agency uh, with a mission to shape everything that next. We have offices in nine different locations across the globe. And we actually come together about merging existing agencies into one big uh, mega agencies, which means that we have a completely cross disciplinary team. Um, and uh, we also say, uh, tell ourselves that we're veterans in the, what we do. Uh, so uh, with the experience that we've been out here uh, in Hong Kong, um, we work with the strategic design. We work with product design and development, mobility in cities, and new ways of working. And those are the areas uh, that our different clients uh, come from and the products that we see really booming in this area of the Greater Bay Area. So if we just go take one step back and look traditionally with why people come out to uh, Hong Kong and also to uh, what we previously called the um, Pearl River Delta area, for, um, and that was usually traditionally just to come out to, or I wouldn't say just, but usually would best be based on the people having a product ID that they wanted to execute, produce um, in China at a good price to deliver to the Western market. And that's usually, that's actually how we started off our business. We were industrial designers helping clients to produce products um, that was going to be produced as a good price in this region but then be sold to a Western market. But what we see now is uh, definitely a change um, because when people have a product ready, it's not the same thing as it needs to go back to a Western market. It's actually very much a market out here in this region. So when you have a product 
uh, and you have it ready-made, it's produced. Um, we see um, a lot of people being interesting in actually like going into the uh, Asian market. Uh, and uh, while doing that, um, there's a few things uh, to consider. Uh, one of them is that uh, the production in China is going very much from a low end to high end production, which means that the uh, prices are less competitive, um, but also that the skills are more competitive out here. Uh, well, we, for example, can see that a lot of like the textile production uh, is moving to Vietnam uh, due to lower cost. But we'll also see that the really like high end production of those things is still staying in the Greater Bay Area and around here, because that's what that's where the skills are. And that's the level where we can really deliver deliver to a good level. Going back to what many of the other speakers have uh, talked about today, um, it's definitely that Hong Kong is definitely at the doorstep to the Greater Bay Area. That was usually before known as the, the word factory. It was here. Everything was produced. But today it's so much more than that. It's really one of the most important tech centers of the world in terms of innovations, startups, and also like test beds for new products and in terms of also actual products, but also tech products in terms of apps and services. So it's a very interesting market to go into. Um, it's really about going from being the center of only production to a gigantic market opportunity. And by that, is a, there's lots of companies and um, maybe we'll hear from Peter later, but what he's doing in terms of the Amazon trading in China is one thing, but there's also reaching out to the Chinese consumer uh, through a lot of what we see now, it's um, through the, the social media apps that you, you do business in. There's a very high appreciation of Scandinavian design uh, in China and in Hong Kong, which means that businesses uh, such as ours uh, that are Scandinavian based are very much appreciated and they usually have a little easier way into the market if we choose the right partners to do so. Um, one can wonder uh, why I talk so much about uh, China uh, and the Greater Bay Area in a seminar that's supposed to be doing business in Hong Kong. But the fact is that if you wanna go into China and you wanna go into the Greater Bay Area, the supportive network for international companies in Hong Kong is fantastic. And it's been that for years. I've been part of it myself uh, when I'm in um, 2008, uh, set up our first um, company within the Design Incubation Center in Hong Kong under then the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park. Uh, that was how me and Anna started to build our company. And through those years, we have support of Invest Hong Kong Creative Industries. Uh, we've also attending a lot of the Hong Kong TDC's uh, programs. Uh, and not the least, um, being vice chair of Sredsham, Swedish Sham of Commerce has also making, it is and making a fantastic journey like for, for us uh, because it's uh, the network of support of other companies and the knowledge sharing that we have there and also knowledge transfer within the organization of Sredsham, Business Sweden, and also the consulate and Nordic Innovation House is fantastic and something that you can um, you know, step directly into when you enter to, into Hong Kong. And that will really, really give you this leverage to go into something else. Um, usually uh, Hong Kong is very much uh, like, um, and the Greater Bay Area is a very place where everything is happening. There's a lot of things going on here. There's uh, trade fairs, there's events, there's seminars. We also have royalty visiting, visiting usually. Uh, so it, it is a place where things really happen and where you, if you enter to this as a Scandinavian company or a Swedish company, really can have a really good access to it directly through the support that we see in Hong Kong. And that's why uh, we as a company, ManyOne, serves a client like these ones that you see here with IKEA, Legal, Puma and Jabra and Ericsson because this is the brand that works in Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area. And this was a very quick recap for me, <laughs> but thank you so much. And do let me know if you have any more questions. Thank you, Katerina. I mean, really, really interesting. Uh, and I can't see that we have any questions, but I, if I may just comment, I mean, I think what you are describing here is a fantastic journey 
and how you have kind of found your place in this really vibrant part of the world. And, you know, maybe we will come back with questions from the audit audience late, later on. That sounds great. But, yeah, so, but I think we will then move on to, to the next speakers. And that will be um, the title of your speech is, uh, it's the Scania, Hong Kong and Greater Bay Area story. And we, I should, should also say that Scania is uh, one of the founding members of the Hong Kong Chamber of Commerce here in Sweden. So thanks for being a great supporter for, for us. And I mean, Scania has done a fantastic journey in many parts of the world and uh, Hong Kong and China not being an exception. Um, and just a short intro, I have two distinguished speakers from Scania. Uh, first, it's called Fredrik Sakrisson. And um, you have studied at universities in Stockholm, UK, Germany, and France. And you started to work for Scania in 1998 and have had various positions uh, within this global company. And uh, you have since 2016, uh, you are based in Hong Kong with your family and you are um, the managing director and regional director of South, South China uh, today. And then together with you, you also have Alexander Mastrovito who is going to also share his comments here. And you are educated at Uppsala and Cambridge universities. You have spent 14 years in mainland China and Hong Kong mainly working in the automotive industry. And uh, as of now, you are the head of sustainability at the Volkswagen Group commercial vehicle brand Scania in Asia Pacific and Hong Kong. So with that, I would like to hand over to you to talk to us about your successful journey. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, sharing the Presentation here also. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Do you see this now? Yeah, it's very, very easy to follow. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so happy to share uh, our perspectives from Scania Hong Kong then uh, to uh, in doing business here in, in Hong Kong and to uh, show a little bit how we then uh, drive the shift towards sustainable transport systems. And uh, this is uh, my little family, uh, or you could say a big family together with Scania. We have a big rolling park here, so you really feel at home. We came here five years ago, as you mentioned, Torborg, and uh, it's been a fantastic five years, both in tough times and uh, in uh, in uh, very good times here for Scania. And we will now be happy to share a bit of, of our journey. But first, Alex, a couple of words. About yes, you. hi everybody. Um, Alexander and me and my family, we've, we've been part of the Scania family for almost eight years here and now here in Hong Kong. Okay, uh, so Scania is then part of the Volkswagen big family, 12 brands and uh, under the umbrella of Trayton, the heavy commercial vehicle manufacturers then Scania, MIN and Volkswagen commercial vehicles are organized. And uh, uh, we um, will uh, talk a little bit about our solutions uh, in the trucks, buses and coaches engines and our backbone services. We uh, take care of and uh, support our customers. So in the trucks, we have some 36 different applications in the segments of long haulage, urban applications and construction, uh, buses and coaches, uh, a broad range of applications within the city bus and, uh, and uh, coaches for trans public transportation. And then in the engines, they are um, operating 24 hours in, in many different applications, such as wheel loaders, um, patrol boats, you can mention power gensets. Uh, and the services then really our backbone in, in guaranteeing and supporting our customers to have the maximum uptime. So the world of Scania, very short. Um, this is how it looks. We're uh, operating and, and we're selling and servicing our vehicles then in more than 100 countries. 
and uh, 51,000 employees uh, everywhere we are, close to our customers with a dealer network, with workshops, and very proud of our parts availability of 95% and guaranteeing this uptime. And you can also see here Hong Kong, where we have within the science park here, interesting projects within research and development. Uh, here we can see that we have our stronghold in Europe, um, but, and what we will show a little bit more in detail going forward here in the presentation, Asia is on the go and we are um, uh, having fantastic growth opportunities here in the region. More about this a little bit later on. So with that short introduction about Scania, then doing business in Hong Kong. Well, our journey here, here in Hong Kong started already in 1984. And um, uh, since then, uh, we have um, focused a lot on uh, always, and that you can see in Euro 5, Euro 6 here on the top, uh, promoting and uh, trying to uh, implement the highest emission standard level. Um, that is a, a, our way of really ensuring that we drive this shift towards sustainable transport systems. In 2008, we uh, bought a company here and became a fully owned subsidiary. Um, and in 2015, another milestone in our history here, where we came into this ecosystem here in the Science Park with innovation and technology, uh, where we could find even more uh, cooperation opportunities with other companies also and in other partnerships to drive this shift. Um, another milestone here in 2018, we, we launched our new truck generation, a global launch, which came to Hong Kong thereafter. And also in the beginning of this year, we uh, are operating under dual brand. So Volkswagen commercial vehicles joined our family. Another big uh, milestone here during the year, actually just recently since 1st of September is when we uh, became part of the Scania China organization. And we have the head office for the South region, as we call it, you see which provinces are included here uh, with um, our captive dealers, our non-captive dealers, and a lot of workshops here to, to support our customers. So uh, that is a, a very interesting opportunities ahead in the Greater Bay Area and this whole region. Okay, so working at Scania Hong Kong. Well, foundation of our company, our team. And um, uh, we put a lot of effort, a lot of focus on developing and motivating our teams. Uh, we're 189 persons at the moment. Uh, you can see in 2008, we were 40. So it's quite a, a growth journey here since uh, we, we um, started the operation on the Scania Hong Kong flag. Seven and a half thousand Scania vehicles on the roads, and as mentioned, then also joining forces here with Scania Volkswagen commercial vehicles in the beginning of the year. So this is a map. <coughs> Sorry. So this, this map of, of Hong Kong is probably not the usual map you see. Uh, here we are not seeing the island at all, uh, where where we, we don't have uh, our, uh, let's say, um, majority of our customers. So they are operating here in the new territory area. And this is where we have our workshops then. And um, on the right, you see Science Park. And um, we also have a mobile workshop on the Lantau Island on the very bottom left corner, um, so supporting and servicing our coaches predominantly running on the Hong Kong Lantau um, Chu Hai Bridge, uh, John, uh, Hong Kong Macau Bridge. So uh, I'll finish off with this slide now before I leave the word to uh, Alex to talk a little bit more about our sustainability journey um, with our core values. Our core values that are really our DNA, you could say, uh, core values that are guiding us in our operation and are leading uh, us wherever we are in the world, in Hong Kong or uh, anywhere else. And uh, it's really creating this um, uh, family feeling, uh, supporting our customers, respecting the individual, uh, being efficient, uh, and uh, having a determined view about where we're heading with integrity. So uh, I'll leave that uh, bridge over to you now. Alex, to take us through driving the shift, what does it mean? And what, uh, what are we doing here in Hong Kong to make that happen? Yeah, thank you very much, Carl, Frederick. So 
I think it's excellent that you stopped um, with our core values. And I think our core values are a great reason why Scania has come out publicly and made a very large and, and, and solid commitment to sustainability. Uh, what Scania decided to do uh, roughly five years ago was to, to do this thing that we call driving the shift. What we mean then is that we want to be the facilitators and the enablers for the whole transport system to shift towards a sustainable one. Next slide. And in order to further commit to this ambition, this year Scania launched something globally, um, which is uh, a new set of targets for ourselves. We joined the Science-Based Targets Initiative. This initiative is set up in order for private enterprise to be able to set targets that will be in line with the IPCC's 1.5 or 2 degree um, climate change target towards 2050. Scania has committed targets that are in line with the 1.5 degree target. And as you can see here, we have two different targets. One is for our own operations, the 50% target, but our own operations is a very small part of our environmental impact. The large part comes from our customers' operation, our trucks that are running out on the street. And there we have an ambition to reduce that impact by 20% already by 2025. Next slide, please. And in order to do that in Hong Kong, we are working with our three pillars of sustainable solutions, energy efficiency, renewable fuels and electrification, and smart and safe transport. But we have analyzed the market here in Hong Kong in detail. And this is the little dashboard you see at the bottom of the slide. It's too much detail to look into right now. But what we can see from it is that we might not have many opportunities when it comes to alternative fuels and renewable fuels or even electrification yet. But while we're waiting for those opportunities to come, we can work with fuel efficiency measures and we can work with smart and safe transportation solutions. Next slide. And we have worked with driving this transformation for quite a while right now. As Saki mentioned in our timeline, we were first in Hong Kong with introducing the Euro 5 emission standard. We were also first with introducing the, introducing the Euro 6 emission standard. And the Euro 6 emission standard is now the world's highest emission standard for commercial vehicles. And we, I believe, were instrumental in accelerating the introduction of this emission standard here in Hong Kong. We were also first with bringing the um, first hybrid electric uh, heavy truck to Asia, actually. And um, if we look at the next slide, here you can see our hybrid electric truck in the science park. And by the way, you can see the science park behind me as well. And being allowed and having this opportunity of sitting in the science science park and being part of this ecosystem, as uh, Carl Fredrik mentioned, has been really a way for us to turbocharge our sustainability efforts that are a function of our R&D work that we do here. Next slide. And one good example of that is, is, as Albert Wong already mentioned in his speech, our fleet management center, which was a global, world, uh, global first for us in the Scania world, which we set up here in the science park, a place where we can run virtual driver competitions, where we can do fleet improvement projects, where we can support our uh, service network with flexi flexible maintenance solutions. But it, the science park has been so much more um, in, for example, allowing us to plan and project, uh, for example, e-mobility pilots and also work with other big data initiatives. But in the end, for us, uh, we're not in this alone here in Hong Kong. Uh, we have um, been working with many partners among, uh, among them, of course, Swedcham and, and the Consulate General, but also a lot of different other platforms, the European chambers, NGOs, um, the Hong Kong government, in order for us to really have impact when it comes to our sustainability work. We need the whole ecosystem in Hong Kong with us. And I think this has been a very, very positive journey for us here in Hong Kong. So back to you, Sake. Hey, thank you, Alex. Then um, how do we see the future of the business in, in Hong Kong in the Greater Bay Area? A couple of concluding slides to summarize those success factors. And starts with, with the brand. Uh, the brand in 
uh, uh, anchored in our products and in our services, which is then, of course, uh, having the foundation in our team. So um, uh, it's about maintaining and developing the close relationships. And being such a small market, we are uh, having a lot of, of um, one to one relationships here uh, with all our customers. And uh, you see a couple of pictures here with, with our customers and also on the, on the bottom there with our partners. Uh, we have, uh, for example, on the right there, it's Scania Heiger uh, coaches where we are uh, uh, selling uh, here broadly in, in Hong Kong and in, in parts, many parts of Asia. Uh, on the left, you see a fire services application, uh, fire truck, where we are selling most, most of the volume in, in Hong Kong. Uh, again, based on our brand. So we make tailor-made products and uh, it's an application focus here on the middle. You see the, the bridge where, where one of our coaches are operating. Um, we say always to overperform in service is the backbone of our, of our success. And uh, this is so true. Uh, here you can see the workshops. This is how it looks in Hong Kong. And it looks uh, differently in every market. The most important is that we fulfill our customer demands. Um, we're far away here from, from the head office and we are having um, our vehicles coming from, from Europe. Uh, so with a little bit longer lead time. Uh, so the support coming from our head office team, our regional team as well, based in, in Bangkok, um, is really important so that we can uh, make, really make sure that we're efficient in, in our uh, process, in our flows. And also with the team Sweden here in Hong Kong, Christian and um, Per, who will come on later, uh, paying us a visit here the other day and, uh, and having a look at our hybrid. And um, I know that you, Torsten, you're online as well, uh, our main contact together with the whole team in, in Sweden. So uh, it comes down to, to this, uh, our team, and uh, actually uh, you see on the right there, uh, the Scania World Bulletin in, in 1995. Many of those guys are still in our team. I think this is mainly the, this is the, the base and the foundation for, uh, for our success here. Uh, also bringing, of course, uh, the cultural uh, differences here on the, on the bottom left, you see. Then we have a lot of interesting things happening in China, and China will be our biggest market in the region and one of the biggest in, in, in our Scania world, uh, where just recently, the other week, there was an announcement of the Rugao production facility being then um, uh, communicated, a lot of media about this. So... Uh, of course, the lead time and the, the efficiencies in the flows will be even more, um, more improved. So with that, Torborg, we uh, say thank you very much from our side, and we'll be happy to answer all the questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I mean, really impressive story. Um, and since we, we might have a few minutes for questions, so I also would like to, before we move on to the next speaker, I haven't seen any questions on the chat. So maybe maybe this could be a question both to <clears throat> Carl Fredrik Alexander, but also Katarina. I mean, because you are <clears throat> you are sharing with us, you know, fantastic uh, success stories. But probably you have, you know, it has been some challenges as well uh, during the way. Uh, so it it could also maybe be an interesting to if you would point at something. That has been, uh, you know, extra difficult for you. But how you have overcome that? If it's something that you come to think about and that you would would like to share with us. Yeah, I mean the challenges we uh, we have every day, right? And uh, not at least in these turbulent times. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, what has been the most important is focusing on, on, this, on the safety and uh, on everyone's well-being and that we can, mm -hmm. uh, by having a, a safe environment, that we can then uh, also support our customers to do uh, the best uh, for them. Mm -hmm. um, in our sustainability journey here, Alexander, maybe a couple of words about how you see the, um, the challenges, because we are, of course, having a lot of initiatives and we want to drive the development forward as much as we possibly can. Um, there are 
uh, challenges in this area, which would be interesting, I think, for Alexander to touch upon. Mm. Yeah, and it's very easy to find challenges. And I think it's been a constant uphill battle to try to introduce sustainable solutions, uh, not, not only here, but globally uh, for Scania. And um, it's been a constant challenge to keep the awareness up, to keep the messages fresh, to keep this top of mind of all our stakeholders uh, within Hong Kong, uh, both government, but also our customers, uh, our, our suppliers and everybody else. And um, I would say that this has paid off. I, I think Hong Kong should be commended for uh, having this 2050 uh, target of carbon neutrality that they re very recently announced. And I think this is something where we have also uh, been helping out uh, because the whole uh, sustainability community, including us and all the NGOs and all the different platforms have been asking for this and have been um, voicing their demands towards the government for a long time now. And um, now we have this announcement and this will help us to gain momentum for the future. So um, up until now, there's been a lot of challenges and it's been tough work and I don't think that's going to change, but at least we're seeing the seeds of a little bit of momentum building here. So that's very good. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. And maybe Katarina, if you had something you also wanted to share with us? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, no, I would say that, you know, the challenges are continuous uh, mm -hmm. from, from where you start. I mean, when you first, uh, if you look at the whole journey of entering a new market is mm -hmm. first about learning the culture uh, mm -hmm. and see, you know, what works and not works. Um, it's getting used to a new um, like system of business, uh, also from an administration level, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's always new challenges, and I think that you have to take them on quite tirelessly and be prepared that they always will uh, come to you. And I think in recent years, it's been more political challenges in Hong Kong. Um, but those ones is also very much about uh, keeping calm and assessing the situation and also what... Um, was pointed out before that it's it's a lot about keeping uh, you know your team safe and and informed uh, about the, what's going on uh, to make you know make worry less for people and so people can focus on on the work and what they want to do i would say that's, mm -hmm. that's a good way to sum it up <laughs> thank you and I, I i will kind of maybe end this part of the session with a chinese proverb that i think kind of captures a little bit of what we have been talking about until now, but also maybe a little bit of my philosophy with, and, and the verb, um, the proverb reads like this, when the winds of change blows, some people build walls and other, other build windmills. And I just think it's super, you know, <laughs> it's just, you know <laughs> go out there and grab it. And, you know, you can be depressed a little bit, uh, you know, a while about something that is not going your way, as you have all been talking about, you know, it's just to think about what can we do now. And I think your stories has been perfect examples about constant change and how you have kind of uh, embraced it and continued to develop your fantastic businesses. So um, for thank you for that. And actually, uh, with that, I would like us now to turn to the next uh, part of the seminar. And um, it is now going to be the Nordic Innovation House in Hong Kong who will be presented. Um, and we will have Bin Johnson uh, with us, or we have Bin Johnson with us already. And Bin, you are the director of, of the Nordic Innovation House in Hong Kong. And you are educated at Lund University. Uh, and you have worked for several Nordic large companies as well as startups. And in 2007, you moved to Shanghai to help a Swedish firm that wanted to expand into the Chinese market in 2000, uh, to the Chinese market, sorry. And in 2011, you were hired by an Asian area, you were hired as uh, an area manager for Asia for a leading, leading Nordic company in the raw material sector. And after some years in that position, um, you moved on to work as a consultant. And then you are now here with us. So I leave the floor over to you, Bin. 
Hello, here. Can you hear me? This is Bin Johansson from Hong Kong. Yes, we can. Perfect. So, uh, yes, I thought that uh, to be one of the last speakers will be very difficult. But now I see this is a perfect because basically Nordic Innovation House will, will wrap up everything and echoing everybody what you have said. So, um, hmm. So what, what, what do we do? Nordic Innovation House, we are helping the smallest tech companies from the Nordic and take them out of Nordics to all over the world. There are five houses in the world. We, are, we have presence in Silicon Valley, New York, Singapore, Hong Kong, and newly opened Tokyo. So what we do is to be the local knowledge and a soft landing platform for the, the Nordic tech startups. And uh, you have seen this before, uh, so this is good to be the last one speaking. So everyone know what Greater Bay Area is, and uh, we are comparing us to the other Bay Areas. So when you counted the GDP, uh, GDP growth rate, populations and size. So basically population and size, uh, GB is already the biggest. This one is a projection for the 2030. And by that time, I think that uh, we will be the biggest Bay Area compared to all this you have seen. And you have seen this one before. I borrowed this one from Science Park. And uh, the um, core here uh, with the nine plus two cities uh, for, uh, that make up the Greater Bay Area. So Hong Kong and Shenzhen, Guangzhou and Macau. This is the core engines for the, for the GBA. Huh. So um, we have uh, seen this also before, why Hong Kong? Uh, like um, what King Leung said, Mr. King and Mr. Wong said, Ho Hong Kong is the heart, it's a gateway in to the rest of China. And um, everyone have already talked about that, the manufacturing hub, but the whole Greater Bay Area is actually a very tax savvy people. I think that the whole Shenzhen right now uh, you can actually uh, use, you, you don't really have money anymore. Basically, we pay everything with a phone and an app. And uh, when it comes to the uh, design prototyping, Katerina already talked about it, is uh, you basically manufacture everything in um, the area right now. Uh, and uh, as from my job here, as the startup ecosystem of uh, all the Nordic countries, a, um, some numbers to crunch here. So number of startup in, in the Hong Kong, it have grown to 3,184. And numbers of staff employed within the sector is a little bit above 12,500. And we ju I'm just gonna give you some Swedish number just to see that uh, Hong Kong it's on the way, but uh, the reason everyone really want to work with a Nordic tech startup is because we have a lot of startups and we are quite good at doing what we are doing. So uh, just in Stockholm, I think the numbers for 2019 is 8,000 startups and over 50,000 people employed within the startup ecosystem. And the Nordic Innovation House, it's a soft landing platform for all companies, tech startups that want to have a look at a Greater Bay Area and go through Hong Kong. So the partners work, I'm working with is of course the Science Park, Cyberport, and also some smaller family offices just to help you to land and uh, to echo the Mr. Wong, the incubation phase for the, to, uh, for the tech startups should um, not really, they're not really time for them to come um, to the uh, Asia market yet. So I will recommend like uh, incubation first in your own country and then find a market and try your product before looking. So when you're in the acceleration phase, and uh, maybe scaling up, then Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area would be a very good market for you to uh, come and sell you sell your product, find partners, or find investors. So the Nordic Innovation House team in Hong Kong, we are funded by the Nordic Innovation, are backed up by the uh, the Nordic Ministers of uh, the Council of Ministries, and the operating partner here is Business Sweden, and again. Uh, China is quite a big country. So here in, 
Hong Kong. Uh, the uh, I work closely with uh, the Finnish and Swedish consulates, and then we have the Norwegian and Danish consulates in Guangzhou, and also the Embassy of Iceland in Beijing. And the other trade promotional offices, it's uh, Business Sweden, Innovation Norway, Business Finland, and Promote Iceland, and also Innovation Center Denmark, who is in Shanghai. So why, why Nordic countries? We, most of the time, we know already that um, the uh, Nordic countries score very high in different indexes. And uh, this is just to show that our innovation, uh, it's still coming and popping up. So what do Nordic Innovation House do to help this smaller startup to come to Hong Kong? I try to um, create different events uh, to help them to land in Hong Kong and then continue to look at the Greater Bay Area together with my partners here. So one of the events I'm doing every year now, uh, it seems like it's repetitive. So this is Mr. King Lung's FinTech Week. Uh, so this year it's a hybrid form. So no, it's a now this year is a totally online form, and uh, we managed to bring five new fintech companies and uh, two old ones who want to join and uh, really scale up. And with um, Invest Hong Kong's help, most of them find this um, platform really interesting to join. And uh, the other one, the other um, events for that I also do every year. Uh, is the Gerontech, the elder care and handicaps care. And it's very interesting to see how Hong Kong, how, how much funds there are for products and for services and for investment, uh, as long as you know what kind of market you're into. Here, the Gerontech, they have a 1 billion Hong Kong dollar funds buying, basically buying products for the elder care and handicaps care here in Hong Kong. And um, we are, most of us are very focused on the fintech side and all the IT side and 5G. But basically, this is quite a big market for the Nordic um, health tech side. And, and uh, for this year, because of the, um, uh, the pandemic, there was not much. Um, the general tech has to be taking both a hybrid form. So here in Hong Kong, we have uh, the full exhibition in Wanzai Exhibition Center while um, we others have an online speak about uh, how to best um, exchange um, services and products. So uh, I have been introducing a little bit of the Swedish cluster, um, Region Westerbotten and also Region Skåne, of uh, what kind of products we have to offer. Very interesting discussion. So this so uh, next year, I hope that uh, normalcy is back so we can do <laughs> really like ship our products over here and show showcase it. Uh, another one that I also do every year is the China High Tech Fair in Shenzhen. Uh, last year I have a pavilion and brought 25 uh, Nordic startup uh, to Shenzhen and we did partner search, uh, partner search investment pitching uh, opportunities and also uh, B2B meetings. So this year, again, it's a little bit a hybrid form. Uh, those who are already in China could join physically in the uh, uh, China High Tech Fair in Futian, in Shenzhen, while we others who could kind of fly in have an online uh, meeting. So, so for the uh, Nordic side, it's quite good. We still managed to get 20 companies overall, both pitching to Chinese investors and do partners B2B meetings, and also managed to um, bridge the gap between how to get to know China better and the ecosystem over in Shenzhen. And I also did some um, opportunities uh, here in Hong Kong together with the Alibaba Entrepreneurship Fund and uh, Gobi uh, Partners. Um, for now, right now, while we're talking, I actually, there's actually five companies that we are in talk that have sent to Hong Kong Science Park because the Science Park has so much programs just like uh, Albert and um, uh, Scania. It's like, so it's not only for smaller companies. So Science Park have actually all kinds of programs, everything from incubation phase, acceleration, till their um, a, uh, LEAP program, who is worth 4.7 million for companies who is in uh, the acceleration phase and go to market. And the last one, everyone is looking for some kind of unicorns. <laughs> and the elite program is actually for big players who is in pre-IPO phase. 
So um, for those who don't know, uh, Science Talk is not only uh, like one, one acceleration platform, it's basically uh, the acceleration platform for all companies, small ones up to the big ones. Uh, so next year, what, am, uh, what kind of programs I will, um, will I try to get and help the Nordic tech companies to come over to the Greater Bay Area? For, uh, for the three that I've just mentioned, that will be going on again next year. But here is another interesting, the whole gaming industry and digital entertainment um, industry, the sector. Uh, Cyberport have started the DELF, the Digital Entertainment Leadership Forum. So the Nordic Innovation House is basically scale the uh, scale the Nordic tech to to Hong Kong, like to Greater Bay Area through Hong Kong. But here I will do the same thing. I will scale Hong Kong back to the Nordics. So I will start with uh, if everything goes as planned. Next year we will bring some uh, interesting digital entertainment companies to Finland and Sweden. So this is uh, the um, the topics that uh, it was brought up during this forum. But there's many more. But esports will be definitely a very interesting sector to check out. And because of the all um, echoing Christian, Switchem, and Johan, Hong Kong have been a, a little bit tough. I took over the house in um, beginning of June 2019. So it have, have been a quite an interesting ride. So the question I got from small companies and also SMEs is like, how do we work with China in the future and Hong Kong? So I plan to, together with all the other Nordic, um, um, the, uh, all, all, all my Nordic partners to uh, kick off a management level program for those who are interested to come and get to know um, the ecosystem and how to work with Greater Bay Area and Hong Kong. So contact me if you're interested for details. Here's an example for how this program can look, at, look like when we are allowed to travel. It has to be in person. You have to come over and see how the ecosystem and how we work in uh, the Greater Bay Area. So our four or five days cross-border program, starting in Hong Kong, continue to Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and then back to Hong Kong to wrap up. Uh, and um, I was planning to show you a video before, but um, I think it's better just to like, if you're interested to see what we have been doing, uh, here is the links to the videos if, uh, for uh, you to have a look at um, what Nordic Innovation House have been up to. That's all from me. Back to you, Torboy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And um, as you concluded in the end, I mean, we are all waiting for when we will be able to travel over to Hong Kong. I mean, as of now, it's <laughs> possible. So, but you know, like the spirit of, you know, all the things that are have been happening uh, despite uh, the situation, but also that is in, in the planning. And I actually saw, saw that we had a question from Mats Brudian. So I think uh, if you are still with us, Mats, would you like to ask your question and to whom you are di directing it? Okay. Um, maybe something happened with the technology for Max, but um, okay. With that, um, and before I let Pat on Augustson on the floor, I would, would also like, you know, something that is kind of striking me um, through this seminar and listening to all of you. I think it's, it's also uh, another thing that is really uh, kind of common in all your speeches, and that is really the cooperation. I mean, you are, all of you are lifting it, you know, how to find partners and how you're working together. And I think that's, um, for me, it's probably a little bit unique, uh, the way that you, are, you all are cooperating in Hong Kong, you know, with your different companies, organizations, associations, etc. And I think it's partly, you know, one part of the success stories that you are talking uh, um, about. But with that, uh, I would like then to come to our closing remarks. Um, oh boy, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. There is a question from Mats. He's, he's asking here, is there any examples of collaboration, nano plus AI plus distributed ledger tech, blockchain yeah. fintech in the area? Yeah. 
So um, I think you will have him. Maybe you didn't hear me. I tried to get him to ask the question, but maybe you can answer it because he he didn't reply. As you maybe you maybe you want to reply the question. Uh, well, uh, I think that this question should be um, directed to um, Mr. Wong from Science Park. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that Science Park have an AI just open up a very big AI um, department. Uh, and also the uh, the blockchain fintech arena. It's um, for King. If he's still here, is King and Mr. Wong still here? Because uh, I would also like to know if this is uh, something that it's up okay. with Hong Kong. But I don't. Uh, is any of them left here? No. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, with that, um, I would like now to, to hand over to Mr. Per Augustsson, who is the Consul General at the Swedish Consulate General in Hong Kong. And um, Mr. Augustsson, you took over the position as um, in Hong Kong in September this year. And you have a long career um, behind you um, and worked for the Swedish Foreign Services since 1992. And you have also been uh, based in London, where you were the deputy head of the Swedish embassy, but you were also the deputy head of the Swedish embassy in Beijing. So I would like then to uh, hand over to you, Pai. Uh, do you hear me? Yep, we do. Uh, the video has been disabled, it says, by the host. Ah, uh, okay, maybe the host can help us. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so that we can see you. I try again. Yeah, still the same. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Yep. Hi there. Hi there. Hi there. So I like you know your background. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I want to start by thanking the Switch Jam for lending me this background. Uh, I like it a lot. Uh, it doesn't look like Hong Kong. It looks more like Sweden. I think it is Sweden, uh, but it's green and beautiful. Uh, thanks, uh, Torboy and everyone uh, who have organized this webinar. I think it's a great uh, opportunity for us to connect and to talk to each other, share perspectives, very timely. Uh, and uh, we all, we're all trying to promote uh, connections and business opportunities uh, between Sweden and Hong Kong. And this is a great way, I think, to connect us, uh, Hong Kong and Stockholm. So good idea, good initiative. Um, we heard a lot about opportunities. I was very impressed by uh, what was said about, uh, for instance, the area of fintech, very exciting. Also, what we heard about the uh, uh, science and technology park, a very interesting place. I visited uh, several times. I encourage uh, anyone to connect uh, to the park. Uh, great potential there for cooperation, I think. Also, uh, like Alexander, I want to make reference to the uh, recent policy address of the chief executive, uh, where one issue uh, in particular caught my interest, uh, just like Alexander uh, was referring to, the climate-related policies that are coming now uh, from the Hong Kong government, the greening of Hong Kong, uh, the carbon neutrality goal. Uh, this is uh, very interesting uh, in terms of opportunities for any company any actor, any individual with knowledge and experience uh, and solutions in those areas. Um, so that, that's uh, something to think about for, I think, for, for many. Uh, we also heard about challenges. Uh, of course, COVID uh, is still upon us and challenge for, uh, for everyone. Uh, but also uh, you know, several referred to the changing political environment here. And uh, you, Juan and Christian uh, uh, talked about the climate business climate survey that was made recently, uh, where, where it also uh, was clear that there is a lot of worry among uh, companies in particular about the 
the national security legislation that, that is now in place, uh, worries about Hong Kong's international status, the free flow of uh, information, uh, freedom of speech, uh, the risk of the talent uh, drain, and also, of course, the importance of a continued reliable independent judiciary here in Hong Kong. This is extremely important, I think, for, for businesses as well as for everyone else, of course. So uh, this is something that uh, a lot of people are following and watching very carefully now. Uh, uh, we are also following that, of course. I think it was uh, very exciting to listen to the, uh, to the companies that uh, generously shared their, uh, their uh, perspectives. Katarina, Carl Fredrik, uh, Alexander, uh, talking about their experiences, their, uh, their advice uh, that they can give. Uh, I thought it was inspirational and I hope uh, others uh, found it uh, that as well. Uh, the Nordic Innovation House, uh, great that we have a Nordic Innovation House in Hong Kong and great that we have been leading it. Uh, this, uh, this has great potential uh, and I would encourage uh, any tech uh, startup uh, to connect. It's a great opportunity. And uh, I certainly look forward to watching uh, the house develop uh, in the coming year and, and years. Uh, so with that, again, I just want to say uh, thank you again to Tolboy and the organizers. Uh, this was a great initiative. And uh, I think we had a number of very interesting and exciting contributions today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Per, and thanks for a fantastic summary of a truly interesting seminar. So uh, I would just wrap this up with really uh, saying that thanks to all the speakers who have been sharing these two super interesting uh, um, seminar with us and your contribution has been very, very valuable to, to all of us. And um, we had some questions that were that were not, we were not able to take uh, during the seminar. But as you can see on the chat that we, we now also have some emailing addresses, if you didn't have them before, what the, that you can use and then uh, reach out to, to the ones where you want to ask the questions. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you again uh, and wish you a really good um, continued day, evening, and looking forward to see you all soon. And also since Christmas is soon upcoming, I really wish you a really, really nice uh, Christmas season. And soon uh, we have um, a new year coming up and a little bit later on, we have the Chinese new year coming up. So, you know, a lot of advantages also to get some rest and also to enjoy. So thank you so much and looking forward for, to future cooperation with all of you.